Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, City Efforts to Realize Low Carbon Equitable Transportation. On this webinar, we will discuss local efforts to increase the transportation sector's energy efficiency, reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, and work to ensure that all residents benefit from accessible, efficient transportation. We will focus on and hear speakers from two cities leading the way in sustainable transportation efforts, Washington, D.C. and Minneapolis. My name is Dave Ribeiro, and I'm the Director of Local Policy at ACEEE. I'll be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items. Your screen is customizable. Feel free to make the various windows as large or as small as you would like. You can even minimize them to drop the menu at the bottom of your screen. Presentations can be downloaded as PDFs from the presentation list in the menu. Attendees are in listen-only mode, but can submit questions through the Q&A box at any time during the webcast. The presenters will respond to the questions at the end. The Q&A can be accessed in the menu at the bottom of your screen if it is not already visible. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording and the slides will be shared with the registrants. Now I would like to introduce our distinguished panel of speakers. They are Shruti Bedanathan, the Transportation Program Director at ACEEE, Matthew Gaskin, Air Quality Coordinator at the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation, and Kim Havey, Sustainability Director at the City of Minneapolis. With that, we'll start with our first speaker, Shruti Vedanathan, who again is the Transportation Program Director at ACEEE. Using insights from the 2020 City Scorecard, Shruti will discuss city efforts to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Take it away, Shruti. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today to discuss some activities that cities are taking to reduce transportation uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I am going to provide a brief overview of sort of the current transportation policy landscape at the local level. And I'm largely going to be doing this through the lens of the ACEEE City Clean Energy Scorecard. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the scorecard, this is a report that ACEEE releases annually that evaluates clean energy and energy efficiency actions across all the end use energy sectors at the city level. Transportation is therefore just one part of our analysis, but accounts for about 30% of the points that cities can earn for their policy actions. Um, as most of us know, transportation has replaced the power sector as the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States and is responsible for approximately 28% of emissions um, across the country, across the economy. Um, so what that means for policy is that there needs to be sort of a coordinated approach between uh, federal, city, and state um, policies on transportation efficiency and clean transportation more broadly. Outside of the focus on sort of the uh, vehicle fuel efficiency uh, angle, federal activities over the last five years haven't really done very much to sort of address greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. So what we're finding is that cities have sort of become these living labs for the implementation of ambitious and creative policies to create these low carbon transportation systems. In particular, we're seeing local governments and metropolitan regions play a critical role in addressing um, energy reductions and greenhouse gas emissions and working to ensure that all residents benefit from an accessible, equitable, and efficient transportation system. Additionally, we focus on cities in this report because cities have jurisdiction over some of the largest policy levers that um, we consider important to reduce transportation energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, such as land use policies and investment in multimodal transportation efforts. Um, in particular, um, they uh, so so we see them playing a significant role in sort of leading transportation policy at, at, um, across the country. While there has been unprecedented focus on EVs, electric vehicles, in both the light duty and heavy duty sector as a potential climate mitigation strategy, um, we think at ACEEE that a comprehensive approach to greenhouse gas reduction in transportation at the federal, state, or local levels really needs to sort of be um, holistic and include the efficiency of individual vehicles, but also the transportation system as a whole. In particular, we like to focus on the interrelationship of the transportation system with land use policies and housing policies. And this is sort of reflected in the approach that we take in the 2020 City Clean Energy Scorecard. So as you can see on the screen, um, this is the breakdown of the points that we allocate for policies um, that cities can implement in their transportation sectors 
you'll see that we have first of, first off we have a category um, sort of generally called sustainable transportation, which is our catch-all category for sustainable transportation planning and greenhouse gas target setting specific to the transportation sector. Next, we award about six points for location efficiency policies, and this includes um, uh, scoring cities on their zoning codes that sort of encourage transportation-oriented development and, and location efficiency, um, their parking policies, and then also their um, location efficiency incentives and disclosure policies. Next, we have um, a category on mode shift um, that is focused on the um, creation of modes, mode shift targets um, at the local level and what cities are doing to support, support those mode shift targets. Um, next, we award four points to public transit, and this is increasingly going to be um, a area of particular importance, I think, for this report as cities sort of grapple to address the very grave um, impacts of COVID on uh, their communities, but also on their public transportation systems. As we all know, public transit is sort of in a um, watershed moment, and um, we're definitely going to have to see more activity around um, local and federal and state activity around supporting transportation uh, transit systems. Finally, you'll see that we award four points for efficient vehicles. Two points for the freight sector, because we like to see city activities uh, around um, heavy duty vehicles and freight efficiency, not just passenger vehicles. Three points for equitable transportation policies to support increased access to efficient transportation. And this year, for the first time, we included a um, bonus point on congestion pricing to sort of reflect the activity that we're seeing at city level, um, in city level policy around the use of congestion pricing to um, create sustainable funding revenue streams for sustainable transportation um, and to sort of reflect that there are certain leaders that are that are coming out um, uh, uh, in this space, uh, particularly in New York, um, uh, to address congestion at the city level. So this slide is a sort of brief overview of some of the top line results for transportation from the 2020 um, scorecard this year. And as you can see, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and New York snagged the top three spots in our rankings. Um, overall, there was a wide variety of scores in this chapter, um, and scores range from 0 0.5 points for the lowest scoring um, city to 25.5 points, which um, was San Francisco's score, indicating that there's, um, I think, a large uh, uh, variation in the level of efforts that cities are making on transportation in general. San Francisco in particular continues to raise the bar for transportation efficiency in a number of ways. Um, and one thing I just wanted to point out is that in particular, um, HEEEE uh, likes the fact that the city has made an effort to increase the availability of housing stock near transit through um, the housing element of their, their general plan. So they're really sort of trying to make a distinct effort to integrate housing policy with transportation policy, um, which we very much consider a best practice. Um, Washington, D.C., in addition, has emerged in recent years as a real leader on transportation. And in particular, the Sustainable D.C. Uh, 2.0 plan sort of outlines a set of comprehensive targets for the transportation sector that includes a goal for reducing transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions by about 2.3% a year and shifting 50% of commuter, trip, commuter trips in all wards to public transit by 2032. Um, like San Francisco, the city has also taken steps to better connect low-income residents with sustainable transportation options by passing affordable housing-focused um, policies with um, a um, particular focus on transit-oriented development and providing discounts for a variety of mobility services. Um, and of course, I won't steal Matthew's thunder. We're very lucky to have Matthew Gaskin with us from the D.C. Department of um, Transportation, and so I'll let him sort of take the lead on diving into some of D.C.'s policies in greater detail. Um, just a couple more um, state-specific takeaways that I wanted to highlight for folks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, New York um, was the first city this year to pass um, a congestion pricing program in, in an effort to raise revenues for sustainable transportation, um, while also improving livability um, by reducing congestion within the city. So that's something that we noted in our scoring this year um, and was the reason why we created this um, bonus point category on congestion pricing. Next, you'll note that Minneapolis is also amongst the top 10 scorers for this year's scorecard and is the only Midwestern city to make it to the top 10. Um, again, I don't want to steal Kim's thunder since we have Kim Havey from Minneapolis uh, uh, to talk about some of the activities that have pushed Minneapolis into the top 10. So I'm looking forward to hearing about um, those developments. 
Um, in general, um, the top scorer in this section only received 25.5 points out of the 30 potential points that we have in the transportation analysis. So really, there's a, a fair amount of opportunity built in um, to our score that we, we can recognize through our scoring, even for those cities that are sort of leading the field on their transportation efforts. Um, there were only um, uh, a few cities, um, I think maybe about 11 cities that scored more than half of the available points in this chapter. Um, and the median score was about 8.5 uh, Point. So you can see that there's significant room for improvement for a lot of cities to sort of tackle their transportation greenhouse gas emissions. So um, diving in a little bit deeper, I could spend sort of the rest of this webinar talking about each of the specific um, policy metrics that we have included in the transportation analysis of the city scorecard report, but obviously I don't have the time to do that. So I wanted to sort of take the opportunity to highlight three particular areas of importance and interest to us. Um, the first being what cities are doing on sustainable transportation plans and BMT or greenhouse gas related goals. Um, the second being equitable transportation efforts and the third, um, a focus on transit funding and access. And the reason we chose these three is because um, we sort of see sustainable transportation plans and BMT goals as a foundational policy that is a good indicator of the extent to which cities are prioritizing addressing transportation greenhouse gas emissions. And the second and third cat, um, topics that we listed here are incredibly timely due to the ongoing effects of, of COVID-19, as well as some of the as the ongoing reckoning of the effect of racial disparities um, and how they relate to transportation in this country. So on that note, let's move on to a deeper dive into um, sustainable transportation planning. And you'll note that we've, we've highlighted sort of the key takeaway um, for each of these um, topics at the top of the slide here. For sustainable transportation planning, what our analysis this year sort of found is that cities have sustainable transportation plans, but very few have specific targets to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Um, we see sustainable transportation plans as a best practice to encourage the creation of clean and efficient transportation systems in cities. They often outline multiple strategies. Um, they include uh, including improved transit, location efficiency, and multimodal options to reduce VMT and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but we in particular like to see codified VMT or greenhouse gas reduction targets going hand in hand with those sustainable transportation plans, because we think that these targets give cities benchmarks against which to measure their progress and to gauge success. In 2020, out of the 100 cities we evaluated, seven cities evalu uh, released new or updated standalone tra sustainable transportation plans, which um, we thought was great progress. However, only three cities adopted and codified VMT, vehicle miles traveled, or transportation specific um, greenhouse gas reduction targets. And while we think this is reasonable progress, I think we'd like to see significant more significantly more activity um, around target setting for transportation um, in particular. Um, the opportunity to, uh, to adopt goals is even more obvious when we look at the numbers as a whole. Um, in 2020, only 74 cities out of 100 have some sort of low carbon transportation plan in place. Um, and uh, only 26 of these, however, include targets in their sustainable transportation plans, suggesting that um, leading cities um, are demonstrating their intent through goals, but there's plenty of room for improvement for other cities who have sustainable transportation plans in place to bulk those up with some sort of um, uh, target that they can use to standard set and to track progress against. Um, the other key finding in this space was that we found that it's easier for cities to track greenhouse gas reductions from transportation, but our research has found that BMT tracking and BMT data collection is significantly harder to do. And the things that we discovered is that cities don't seem to track this information consistently, and they tend to use very different methodologies to collect this data and to display it, which makes comparing um, which makes comparing them uh, against each other a little bit more difficult. So that was um, one particular takeaway that I would uh, I would like to flag for our listeners. Um, additionally, um, our analysis of so so overall our analysis of these sustainable transportation plans sort of suggests that um, there's more room for opportunity to include um, targets um, to go hand in hand with sort of the comprehensive policy work that is done in these plans. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, 
to focus a little bit on sort of what cities are doing to integrate equity considerations into transportation efforts. And I know that both um, uh, Matthew and Kim will be talking a little bit about this um, when it's their turn to, to take the stage. Um, ACCCC's City Clean Energy Scorecard includes a separate section to sort of evaluate um, the actions that cities are taking to incorporate, to make sure that uh, their transportation systems are accessible to all. Um, we think that creating accessible, equitable transportation systems will not only be critical to addressing transportation greenhouse gas emissions, but also to ensure that we create livable communities where transportation works for everyone and um, can actually be accessible. Um, so I, I'm getting a, a flag that we're at the 10 minutes, so I will move a little bit quickly around these. But um, the way that we track um, uh, equity on this front right now is very much sort of focused on, on connecting folks to transit and efficient transportation. So we look at low-income housing around transit nodes, low-income access to high-quality transit, and subsidized access to efficient transportation options. Um, and the key findings that we, we have here are that 34 of the 100 cities um, have no policies in place um, targeted at low-income communities, um, and that uh, while there are a number of cities that have some sort of um, discount program for efficient transportation, that there's plenty of room for opportunity to sort of bulk up activity around this space um, and really sort of create those, those efficient, accessible transportation systems. Um, moving on to the transit um, bullet. So the thing I wanted to highlight here, um, I said a little bit earlier, is that COVID-19 is already sort of having a devastating impact on, on transit revenues and ridership in cities. And transit is sort of the single most efficient way to move uh, mass numbers of people in urban areas. So we need to make sure that the funding and the, the, the quality of transit um, is maintained in the future because we have transit has important equity implications. Um, in particular, um, there have been there's been a number of, of um, efforts at the federal level to sort of um, help transit systems um, sustain themselves through this particular difficult, uh, particularly difficult period. Um, in particular, through the federal stimulus, twenty five billion dollars was awarded to, to transit in, in uh, agencies in May of this year, and there was an effort at the house level to bulk that up but with an additional 32 billion that was approved, but hasn't actually gone into effect. Um, and there are also potentially opportunities at the state and local level to, to bulk um, uh, transit funding up. So key uh, takeaways here, um, This I wanna just flag that this year's scorecard doesn't necessarily reflect the impact that COVID is having on transportation, just because there's a, a little bit of a lag in the data that we collect, but. I want to also say that this is going to be a particular area of focus for us as we move forward, because I think then the impact of, of COVID-19 will be sort of evident to us as we as we do this analysis um, repeatedly. Um, so uh, on that note, I am going to turn it over to Dave to make sure that our other speakers have time. There are other few takeaways that I've highlighted on this slide that you guys can sort of uh, read through at your leisure and, and bring up during the Q&A session, but I will leave it at that. So back to you. Great, thanks a lot, Trudy. Uh, our next speaker is Matthew Gaskin, Air Quality Coordinator at the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation. Matthew will discuss Washington, D.C.'s efforts to reduce transportation emissions and advance equity in transportation planning. Thanks for being here, Matthew, and uh, over to you. Thank you, good afternoon, and thank you, David, for that introduction. My name is Matthew Gaskin, and I recently have taken on the role as Air Quality Coordinator for the District of Columbia's Department of Transportation. Uh, thanks for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. And I also need to thank our district colleagues at DOEE, Department of Energy and Environment, for providing some of the information that I will be presenting. Between the pandemic and the climate change crisis that we have all observed this past summer, from the massive wildfires out west to the heat waves and historical rainfalls we have had in the district, we understand that these events have had disproportional effects on communities of color and low-income populations. So we are glad to be uh, a part of today's discussion on the reduction of transportation-related emissions and equity. So with that, I will jump right into this presentation on the work the district is doing to address this challenge, a challenge that with each passing year becomes increasingly apparent that climate change is here and without substantive actions, the effects will only continue to worsen. Here's a graph illustrating the categorical breakdown of emission producers in the district from 2018. 
As expected, buildings and energy account for the largest percentage of emissions. However, for purposes of this presentation, I will focus on the 22% directly related to transportation. Of this 22%, 7% of emissions were attributed to public transit, 10% to trucks and buses, and the remaining 83% are passenger vehicle trips. To meet our greenhouse gas reduction target by 2032 and to ultimate, ultimately obtain our goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, we are implementing policies, projects, and programs to facilitate a mode shift from SOV trips to those of active or public transit. Fortunately, we are not starting from scratch in terms of having goals to address mode shift. We have had mobility goals dating back to 2013 with the first sustainable DC plan produced by DOEE and DDOT's long range plan, Move DC in 2014. And now with the recent update to Sustainable DC 2.0 this past October and the update to Move DC already underway, we have an opportunity to expand on these mobility goals. I mentioned earlier that the district has emission reduction goals. Here is a chart that shows them as well as our tracked progress. Using 2006 as our baseline, we have a goal of reducing our total emissions by 50% by 2032 and becoming carbon neutral by 2050. While we have managed to stay below the trend line, a lot of work is still needed to be done to reach those milestones. Much of the reductions we we have, uh, we have observed are the result of the district relying less on coal burning plants as a main source of energy. In terms of transportation emissions, we have picked most of the low hanging fruit options for making reductions. So now is the time to come, the time has come to implement more challenging policies and projects to take a larger bite out of that transportation emission. I will go into a bit more detail about the transportation emission goal, reduction goals. From our long range plan, Move DC, the goal is to have 75% of commute trips to be done without a car by 2032. From our update of sustainable DC 2.0, these goals are more localized in that they are applied to each of the eight wards in the district. Having 25% of commute trips by active transportation, 50% by public transit, and a reduction of commute trips by car down to 25%. Now that I've talked about some of the policies in place to address climate change and transportation emissions, I will go into some detail about the projects and programs the district has underway to address these challenges. First, I will talk about car-free lanes, followed by some information on our micromobility programs, and finally, active transportation efforts. Since the onset of the pandemic, DDOT's bus priority program has been at work installing three quick build bus priority pi pilot projects as part of our COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. These three quick build projects allow for rapid implementation of improvements to our list of bus priority corridors, require minimal design, and help address current and future needs for bus service. Prior to the pandemic, the district unveiled two bus priority lanes on a major crosstown corridor that carries thousands of passengers daily. These priority lanes have improved the performance of one of the most heavily trafficked bus corridors in the district. A project that began near the start of the pandemic, 14th Street Northwest bus lanes is now near completion. 14th Street ranked the worst among the nine priority bus corridor networks in the district. Looking ahead to the future, we have two transformative projects, K Street Transit Way and the 16th Street Northwest bus lanes. The K Street Transit Way will transform one of the district's major east-west corridors with vast improvements to, to benefit bus riders, motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians. Altogether, these dedicated lanes will increase overall level of service and encourage citizens to opt for public transit as opposed to SOV travel. So let's talk about micromobility. With over 5 million trips taken in 2019, scooters and dockless bikes are a new alternative transit option to SOV travel. As you can see, we have two companies that operate dockless bikes and we have eight companies that operate electric scooters in the district. To make these options more accessible to others and to reduce the instances of these objects blocking the sidewalk, DDOT has installed a number of off-sidewalk corrals. 
And in 2019, DDOT launched a four-month demonstration pilot for motor-driven cycles, also known as mopeds, as part of the district's continued commitment to foster new shared mobility options. The goal of these pro programs is to enhance and increase mobility access by exploring new alternatives to private vehicle ownership by offering other mobility on-demand services to all district residents while reducing transportation emissions. DDOT's bicycle lane program has built 89 miles of bike lanes in the district since 2001. Beginning in 2009, the agency began installing protective bike lanes, and as of now, there are 12 mile, miles of these facilities. Earlier this year, DDOT began its plan to build over 20 miles of new protected bike lanes over the next three years. This ambitious plan will create a network of protected bike lanes that will allow more people to access a low-stress biking experience. We also have the Capital Bike Share, or Metro DC um, bike share system of over 4,500 bikes in over 500 stations. And to ensure that the program is equitable, there is the Community Partners Program that offers significantly reduced membership rates for qualifying residents, including low-income households. Before I move on to the last slide and summarize this presentation, I would like to spend some time talking about equity. As I mentioned earlier, we are aware of the disproportional effects on communities of color and low income populations climate change has had. We understand that there are inequities in transportation policy, but DDOT is taking steps to address this by ensuring all policies and programs I have discussed have equity included in their planning process. Starting with our long range plan, Move DC, which has adopted an equity statement to complement the department's overall mission and vision. This statement will be incorporated into the plan through community engagement, the setting of goals and policies, and having metrics that can be later evaluated to assess performance. Another tool that we use to address equity would be the Equity Emphasis Areas tool created by our MPO, the National Capital Region Transportation Planning Board. Equity emphasis areas are defined as census, census tracts with higher than average concentrations of low income minority populations or both. This is an analytical tool used to identify regional, the regional impacts of planned transportation projects. It can also be used for consideration of equity initiatives. To wrap things up, we have our guiding documents, Sustainable DC 2.0 and Move DC, that contain policies to address the reduction of transportation emissions. We also have programs and projects such as the Car Free Lane and the Capital Bike Share that are added to the equation of addressing transportation emission reduction. All of these work together to produce the outcome of creating a mode shift. This is part of the overall approach to um, what we are doing to meet our carbon goals. First, to move more people and things around the city using less energy, which means shifting trips to biking, walking, scooting, and transit. Secondly, switching all our remaining vehicles, our buses, trucks, cars, and vans to emission-free vehicles. And finally, ensuring that those are all powered by clean, renewable energy. These transportation emission goals are good indicators demonstrating the district's commitment to providing emission reductions in our current and future transportation activities. However, as I've shown earlier with the progress we have made, there is still room for improvement. And thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to David. Great. Thanks so much, Matthew. Now we will hear from Kim Havey, Sustainability Director for the City of Minneapolis. Kim will explore insights from Minneapolis's recently adopted Transportation Action Plan. All yours, Kim. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Havey, and I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Minneapolis. Uh, just last week, the City Council and Mayor approved the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan, or otherwise known as TAP. I'm going to use TAP uh, to highlight some of our goals and strategies that help Minneapolis achieve the fourth place ranking in the ACEEE scorecard this year. I want to thank the City of Minneapolis Public Works staff who have led this effort, along with all those who have contributed to the creation of the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan, as it is going to be our guiding document for achieving our overall greenhouse gas emission goals.
Sorry, I'm having a little, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan is a 10-year action plan that guides future planning, design, and implementation of transportation projects for all people in all the ways that we move around in Minneapolis. This plan is shaped by the Minneapolis Comprehensive Plan, Minneapolis 2040, which many of you may have heard about because of its groundbreaking uh, changes to single family zoning. In that, we are really focusing our efforts around transportation corridors and uh, very uh, narrowly defining areas that are only going to be for single family housing. The Climate Action Plan is also another one that is uh, actively used and helped shape the Transportation Action Plan. The GHG emission goals um, were tied back into the plan to look at yearly reductions that are needed in vehicle miles traveled as well as in uh, GHG from, uh, from transportation uh, efforts. And then we also are looking at our complete streets plan um, that really helps define the prioritization of walking, transit, bikes, and non or low carbon alternatives to single occupancy vehicles. I will hi highlight a few of our transportation efforts as they played an important role in securing 22 and a half points in the ACEEE transportation sector. The areas I will talk about today are sustainable transportation, location proximity, mode shift, and equitable transportation. As of 2018, the transportation sector accounted for 24% of greenhouse gas emissions in Minneapolis, so very similar uh, to Washington, D.C. The city has adopted a goal of an 80% reduction by 2050 in GHG emissions starting from a 2006 baseline. So what this means is incrementally, we need to be reducing our overall vehicle miles traveled, uh, as well as our GHG emissions between one and a half and 2% a year, and overall to reduce our GHG emissions to about 700,000 uh, metric ton equivalents of uh, GHG by 2030. You can see here the current modes of transportation and the mode shift goals by 2030. These mode shift goals, along with that reduction in VMT, are based off of the goals of the Climate Action Plan and the targets that are set on, every, on an every five-year basis. These particular goals have been designed to specifically meet our, our targets for 2030 and for 2050. Nearly one half of people living in Minneapolis are within a five minute walk of high frequency transit. The goal is to increase this number by over 50% over the next 10 years, so that 75% of all residents in Minneapolis are within a one quarter or five minute walk from a high frequency transit access. This is a really important part of our efforts in sustainability because we really want to make sure that people are thinking about not owning a car if they're living in, in the city and utilizing a number of different low carbon transportation options and of course some of the more healthy options of, of walking and biking. So currently nearly two and a half billion miles are driven on Minneapolis streets. Each year, or simply put, we've divided that by the, our, our residents, and that means that uh, on average, our residents drive 15 miles per day on average. For the city to meet its greenhouse gas emission goals, we need to reduce the average amount of driving per person. In other words, Minneapolis residents will need to drive four less miles per day on average, reducing their average daily driving to 11 miles per day by 2030 in order to achieve our greenhouse gas emission goals. Mobility hubs are one of the most recent strategies that Minneapolis is using to create new multimodal infrastructure. In the next 10 years, we hope to make Minneapolis a car optional community. Our mobility hubs include access to, to standard and electric bikes was really, really fun to see how many people got on electric bikes last year. We rolled them out in about uh, June or mid-June, and uh, we had upwards of about 1,500 deployed throughout the city. And I saw so many 
folks riding from all uh, parts of the city as well as all ages um, riding electric bikes. We also have electric scooters we, and access to high frequency transit as well as electric car charging stations, including dedicated car charging for our car, a local nonprofit car share program, which will be switching all of their cars to electric over the next two years. This year, the city of Minneapolis partnered with five local organizations and organizers on engagement, neighborhood resilience, and activities of mobility hubs and to test a new model for the care and neighborhood scale infrastructure via an ambassador program. In North and South Minneapolis, to support this work, the city of Minneapolis received a mobility, um, the city of Minneapolis's mobility hub pilot was selected as one of 10 community-based projects through the Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery Program through the National Association of City Transportation Officials. So this really increased our ability to work with the community and test some new ideas uh, in order on how to engage with the community. Some of the other alternative transportation options include these ideas, bus only lanes, as I mentioned, the mobility hubs, motorized scooter shares and safe routes to school. A recent Twin Cities Metropolitan Council report indicated that $1.9 billion was invested along high frequency transit lines, including, including rapid bus lanes and light rail transit. With all that investment along transit corridors, we are, we are at risk of gentrifying communities and leading to the displacement of people who can benefit the most from improved transportation options. It doesn't have to be this way. We can do an inclusive development, but we have to start with equity first. The city began the process of updating the 10-year transportation action plan in the summer of 2019. The first draft was completed in March of 2020 and was followed by an extensive comments period with m much of our transportation interested groups advocacy groups, pedestrian and bicycle uh, advisory groups, as well as city standing environmental com committees, such as the Community Environmental Advisory Commission. However, with the killing of George Floyd, everything changed and dramatically changed the need for us to really reorganize all of our plans, including the Transportation Action Plan, to reemphasize and re-engage around the areas of reducing racial disparities, and also increasing environmental justice. We needed to pause the TAP process and reflect on how transportation improvements can reduce racial disparities and improve the quality of life for half of the city's population that identifies as non-white. As part of this area, we actually added three new strategies um, that we're looking at, including implementing a racial equity framework for transportation, really working on uh, our ambassador program and outreach to uh, create a longstanding and better trust relationship, and to be able to create transfer transparent and accountable measures for evaluation of our plans, programs, and projects with an eye towards equity. One of the most significant changes was to the TAP equity goal and the values that underpin it. Climate change and racism share the same root causes and they must be part of a holistic solution. Opportunities accessible to those with the most barriers and challenges become accessible to all is a major principle of the equity efforts. An opportunity to apply this new understanding is at the Upper Harbor ter Terminal development, which is pictured here. Neighbors to the east and west of this site are over, are, are over 75% people of color and have half the average income as the city as a whole. Many of these neighborhoods are completely cut off from the river, the Mississippi River, by interstate and large industri industrial areas. This used to be the last and most northern uh, harbor terminal on the Mississippi River, but it was closed three years ago in order to stop the... Uh, in order to stop the Asian carp from infiltrating the uh, Mississippi headwaters and many, many of the beautiful lakes in, in northern uh, Minnesota. Gave a great opportunity for us to really take a look at how we can reuse this 50 acres and nearly one mile of, of uh, riverfront to really reduce uh, barriers for many of our, our communities who have not had access to the river in the past. 
Engagement was expanded with the support of American Cities Climate Challenge and Nelson Nygaard Consulting, which provided funding to work with BIPOC community organizations and to really d delve deeper in uh, the concerns of our, of our most racially diverse neighborhoods. So what does racial equity and transportation mean to you <clears throat> or your organization? When you look at what we're trying to do, we're trying to pr provide frequent, revi reliable, and convenient transportation. Fares that are very low cost and reasonable and solutions for those who are unbanked. We wanna have a transportation system that feels safe to all users. We wanna have a transportation system that links jobs and housing. And in some cases, the folks really want to look at ways to reduce costs associated with car ownership. These are some of the responses that we were getting. We prioritize these efforts in green zones, which are 90% residents uh, who identify as black, indigenous, people of color. And some folks may know of our green zone efforts, but um, it's recently we've been uh, working on uh, equity work plans that have been developed by our two green zones. And a green zone is a place-based policy initiative aimed at improving health and supporting economic development using environmentally conscious efforts in communities that face the cumulative effects of environmental pollution, as well as the social, political, and economic vulnerabilities. So these are our areas that we've identified uh, uh, who are more susceptible to uh, heat island effects, uh, localized flooding, uh, a lower uh, air quality, higher uh, impacts from transportation. So we're really focusing our efforts on, on green communities in many of our activities, including transportation, as well as energy efficiency uh, efforts uh, along those lines. So many people really felt that long-term rela relationships and the need to educate residents as a way to build a constituency and to create more active and engaged community. So really building the capacity and fostering long-term relationships is improvement, establishing ongoing feedback loops with the community, really being culturally center, uh, sensitive via tailored engagement. Uh, it, it was really important. And using age and audience appropriate tools to attract a wide variety of audiences. <clears throat> and then also developing and using community-based metrics on transportation uh, that may be not traditionally been used, but really reflect how our transportation improvements are making a difference in people's lives. Here are some of the comments that we received uh, back um, about the efforts to do some outreach. I think it really shows that people wanna be part of an active uh, um, city and want to really support uh, multimodal transit um, and are excited about the opportunities that mobility hubs, uh, rapid bus lanes, uh, expanded light rail transit, electric bikes are bringing um, to our, our community. So we've done a number of things in regards to our uh, priority networks. We're expanding our pedestrian priority network in which we've added 18 miles um, and include better connections um, across uh, highways and other gaps in the network, and really looking at trying to designate land use clusters um, in Minneapolis 2040 using our, our vision for the future as a way to expand these particular networks. We also have added additional uh, six miles to our all ages and abilities networks. Um, this is really focusing on engaging with uh, people who identify as disabled or use uh, things such as wheelchairs or scooters, and really figuring out ways that we can integrate that within our uh, ages and abilities network. And then we also have our transit priority projects. We've been really working hard on uh, four new bus only lanes. We have a new um, all electric rapid bus line that goes from downtown Minneapolis to the Northwest suburbs. We've expanded an all, all electric rapid bus lane that also goes from Minneapolis to the Southern suburbs. And we're right now, uh, in process of constructing a $2 billion extension to the light rail, light rail transit line, which will go from downtown Minneapolis to the southwestern suburbs and connecting um, our largest Fortune 500 company, United Healthcare's headquarters, into downtown Minneapolis and connecting with all of our other transit lines to St. Paul and, and the airport. So, 
So these actions, these actions, these major asks that were not uh, adjusted um, after getting the feedback were really re-emphasized from um, in, in, in talking with the, the various communities that we did engage with. And so these um, particular parts of our plan were kept in place and um, were not changed. They focus on carbon neutrality by 2050. They focus on having a five minute transit city. They wanna take enforcement out of the plan as part of it. They wanna to commit to snow and ice removal led by the city. That was a very interesting piece where right now, of course, people have to uh, are required to shovel their sidewalks and, and such within 24 hours of the snow ending, but it varies a lot depending on who's doing it. And so it really reduces uh, folks' access um, to walking, especially when sidewalks are not cleared quickly. So we're looking at doing that citywide led by the city. Um, we are adding in all of the, our, our public schools into the all ages and, and abilities networks and our pedestrian priority networks. And we're increasing the mode shift goal to more than three or five trips being taken by non-motorized. We wanna make it, like I had mentioned, a car optional city. So some of the related efforts that we're gonna be working on that are coming up in the next, uh, uh, in the next year include the street operations strategy, really updating our city complete streets policy, which puts pedestrians and, and um, biking first above cars. Um, we're looking at street operations, which include curbside management and how we're gonna potentially deal with uh, public EV charging stations, as well as how we utilize all of the uh, parking spaces, parking meters, things of that nature, which have, have been historically dedicated to cars. We're looking at how we can potentially use those in other ways. One of the most interesting things that I, I uh, recalled hearing from our public works director is that 22% of our city is actually um, public right of way. So we have nearly a quarter of the city of Minneapolis land that's dedicated mainly to the movement of our, our vehicles. So there's a lot of opportunity there to better utilize and maximize and leverage our uh, public right of way. And then we're also looking at moving forward on developing a street design guide um, that'll really help us achieve some of our goals around transport, uh, uh, transit friendly and pedestrian friendly um, transit. So we've got some really great information um, that you can uh, check out about the Transportation Action Plan. You can follow us on, on Twitter. Uh, we have go.minneapolismn.gov is our website for the Transportation Action Plan. And I wanna thank everyone um, for listening today and for your interest in uh, Minneapolis. And I also want to thank the ACEEE for doing this work in the scorecard. I think it's really helpful. Um, it actually really helps prioritize the work that we do. And as you can see within our transportation action plan, much of the, of the sections and goals are related very directly to the, to the elements that you score within uh, the transportation sector. So thanks for your leadership on uh, this transportation as well as the other areas of the AC Triple E scorecard. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kim. Appreciate your presentations and, and, and the kind words for AC Triple E. Um, so now we will address a, a few questions from the audience. Uh, so as a reminder, if you do have a question, you can submit it via the Q and A engagement tool at the, the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first one actually um, is for you, Shruti. It's a clarifying question. Can you define um, mode shift and, and why it's important? Sure, happy to do that. So the way that we evaluate mode shift in um, the City Clean Energy Scorecard is we look at whether or not cities score on, cities have mode share targets in place and how they're tracking progress towards them, whether they have complete streets policies and whether they have car and bicycle sharing policies in place. Um, our definition of mode shift is basically we want to see people using the most efficient forms of transportation for their daily trips. So our goal is to get them out of single occupancy vehicle trips and into more efficient um, uh, transportation. So that includes um, shifting trips to public transit, ride sharing, bikes, bicycling and walking. So the active transportation um, uh, approaches as well. And those three metrics that I just laid out are sort of our ways of evaluating what cities do on that front. Great, thank you, Trudy. Um, now I have a question for, for Matthew and for Kim. 
Um, so someone asked, how do you keep in mind the fact that the transportation system extends into the suburbs? How do you work with your partners to, to meet your goals? Um, so uh, maybe Matthew, you first, and then Kim. Uh, yes. So um, actually, uh, before I got hired on with DDOT, I actually worked for the NPO, the National Capital Region Transportation Planning Board, and I served as the manager of the Regional Public Transportation Subcommittee. Uh, we stay in touch with what's happening in the region by having monthly, attending those monthly meetings and providing each other information and updates and um, best practices. Yes, and I think we, we have a similar approach as well. Um, we work very closely with uh, Hennepin County, which uh, encompasses Minneapolis uh, and most of the much of the western and south uh, southern uh, suburbs. Um, it's the largest population county uh, in in uh, Minnesota, and we work very closely with them um, on transportation uh, access. Um, and then also the Metropolitan Council, which does our long range planning, including um, approving all of the city's uh, comprehensive plans like the Minneapolis 2040 plan. And they are very active in looking at alternatives um, to uh, single occupancy vehicles. They manage the Metro Transit as well too. So they've been, we work very closely with them on um, identifying where bus stops should be, coordinating with our metro mobility aspects, electrifying our uh, bus fleets. All of those are coordinated and, and active with the Metropolitan Council. So it's a, it's a regional approach. And luckily, um, the Twin Cities have, for the last 40 years, have had a, a regional council um, that focuses on increasing uh, access to transit. Great, great. Thank you both. Um, we have a, another question that's coming for, for both of you. So this one, uh, do your sustainable transportation plans integrate with your community development efforts to better place everyday amenities within walking distance goals? Um, so maybe for this one, uh, Kim, you could take it first and then uh, we'll go to Matthew. Yeah, it's one of our top priorities, as I mentioned in, in the presentation. Right now, we have about 50 percent of our residents who are within a five minute or quarter uh, a mile um, of a high frequency transit line. We want to uh, double that so that uh, uh, we, or I'm sorry, increase that by 50% so that we have 75% of all of our residents within uh, a five minute walk or a quarter mile. And in order to do that, we are looking at, for example, the big upper harbor terminal. Um, we are looking at expanding our light rail transit lines and our rapid bus. Uh, lines as well as our bus only lanes, which have been very, very successful. I'll just mention one interesting stat about our, our bus lines. Um, it's about 30 blocks from downtown Minneapolis to uptown. And there's a uptown is, is a very nice area with lakes and a high the concentration or high density of population. Um, on the road to Hennepin Avenue that comes down from uptown to, to downtown, uh, about 75% of the people being moved are on uh, buses. Um, and we have been able to increase the transit, uh, reduce the transit time by about five minutes and getting people more quickly from uptown to downtown. And when we talk about 75% of the people coming on transit, that, me that also means that only 5% of the actual traffic is in um, buses, 95% is with cars. So our ability to get through um, that quickly and rapidly and be able to get more people interested because of its frequency, because of its rapid um, uh, ability to get you downtown or uptown quickly um, has really, I think, spurred more interest in um, expanding our bus lanes throughout uh, a number of other major corridors in Minneapolis. And for, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Let me just find it in here. Um, so do your, do your plans integrate with your community development efforts to better place everyday amenities within walking distance goals? Uh, yes, I, I, I will say it does do that. The, D, the district recently signed on with an agreement with um, portions of Northern Virginia and Maryland, our MPO, to make a more concerted effort to, in, in terms of building more transportation-oriented communities, um, also the expansion of um, bus lanes throughout the region and the district. 
Great. Okay. Um, you know, we're getting short on time here, so I'll try to get two more questions and it might just be one, but there's been a few different ones on um, COVID related concerns. So I'm going to try to group a couple of those um, for you, uh, with, for both Kim and Matthew. So um, one is just a question when it comes to COVID, obviously it's had an impact on transit and making that um, a less attractive to some. Um, so how, is, how are both cities thinking about that? Um, and on a, a similar track, you know, COVID has really created a significant shift from, you know, bringing people to the goods and services to now bringing the goods and services to them. Um, so how does that affect your, your future plans? Um, so maybe Matthew and then, and then Kim. COVID-19 definitely has had a tremendous impact on the public transportation, especially here in D.C. Um, I, I, all I can say is that this is ongoing. Um, I, I can't think of any clear set plans off the top of my head that we have in place to address this, but it's definitely a challenge that we're looking forward to trying to solve. Yeah, I, I, I would... <clears throat> back that up we we don't have a there's not a silver bullet um to really get people back on on transit but again um we're hoping that of course once we have vaccines um that uh we'll be able to feel more comfortable and feel safe uh getting back onto transit and so continuing our efforts to create very easy access five minute walk rapid transit, increasing transit speed reliability and timing will continue to be a part of that I also want to say that um my office, along with our innovation um, office at the city of Minneapolis, is um, uh, looking at all of our, our transit in incentives and programs around uh, encouraging people to take uh, to take alternatives from cars into the office. And as part of that, we're really looking at new strategies around working at home, job sharing, uh, um, office sharing, things like that. Um, I think it's really important for us to, to look at the opportunities that have presented itself. We were really a city that focused on the eight to five, you know, everybody working in the office every day. And I think it's really changed as a result of COVID. We found that we can actually work efficiently. Um, there are many people that wanna come back in the office, but there's an equal number of people that would like to work at home. And we're gonna be really uh, um, updating our policies over the next couple of months so that when we do come back home, we do provide the flexibility um, for people to be working from home. And again, improving people's lives, making it uh, a, a better work environment for them has the uh, uh, indirect result of also lowering carbon emissions from transportation because of these new alternatives being allowed as policy rather than exception um, for the nearly 5,000 employees of the city of Minneapolis. Great, thank, thank you both again. So I think um, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I think we will leave it there. Um, thanks to everyone who asked questions. If we did not get to, to yours, we will try to follow up after that. But um, thanks again for participating in today's webcast. We will send you a link to its recording in a day or so. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to hearing from you again. Take care.